Thanks, Doug. I so better, better pop my glass down. I feel like Dean Martin. So, so data logging. Um, first of all, though, first part of the presentation, I'd like to show you our problem. And the best part of showing you the problem is I can also put up uh, our solution. It's not nearly as innovative as Team New Zealand, but our budget's probably only half a day's worth of their budget. So, so first of all, our problem, the tyranny of scale. Oops, next, it's going to work. So these are our quota management areas in New Zealand. So for those of you who don't know how the system works, uh, anybody can buy and sell quota shares in these areas. Uh, we've got eight of them that are, that are commercially fished across New Zealand and there's a huge range of catch that comes out of those for various reasons that we'll touch on. I'm going to zoom in though to the top of the South Island. It's an area we call Power 7. Beautiful part of New Zealand. Um, and I'm going to zoom in on that a bit more into a place we call Durbel Island. And, and zoom in on that to uh, Stephen's Passage. So here's the start of our problem. So this is an area you can see by the scale there, it's about a five kilometre um, headland that comes out at the top of Stevens Island into Stevens Passage, uh, Duval Island, and it's about half a kilometre wide. Doesn't sound like a problem. So here's a good day's fishing for the boys. They probably spend seven hours in the water, they're probably 400 dives, so don't forget we're on snorkel, so you've got to breathe and go down for a minute and come back up again. They probably swim four kilometres during the day, their bottom time, the actual time they're down there fishing is probably an hour and a half. They've probably covered five hectares and they've probably got 250 kilos of catch. So that's a good day's fishing. First part of the problem is how we report it. So we, we have to report it into a statistical area or a reporting zone. Uh, we report the seven hours in the water and the catch we take. That's all we report. So all of our detail for the day's diving has been lost. It's all mixed up now with the rest of that uh, coastline that appears in the same uh, reporting zone. So that's our first problem. Second problem, the biological variance of the stock. So on this side of the Cape, we've probably got um, power that mature at 100 mils, and after two years growth, are probably 125 mils, which fits in perfectly with our system we've got in New Zealand. But on this side of the Cape, um, it's estimated probably at 90 millimetres maturity, 90 millimetres maturity, and after two years growth, they've only got, got to 100 mils. We can only catch power above 125 mils, so we never get to fish on that side of the Cape. That's a problem. It's just the variance of stock across New Zealand at this really, really fine scale means it's really hard to try and manage power at a New Zealand wide scale. Power don't have legs, so they probably don't walk, move more than 100 metres in their lifetime, and there'd be no genetic transfer between, between those one side of the headland to another. So you have really, really isolated pockets um, of, of the populations that make up the power stocks. And then we have our, our stock assessments, which is how the ministry monitor, uh, and they do it at a quota management area scale, but as you can see by this diagram, we've got very confined pockets of where power live in New Zealand, in, in this area, and they've probably all got different dynamics, and I've just showed you the previous slide, even within those areas that I've highlighted there, there's tiny little wee pockets of varying, varying degrees. And then we catch, we're allowed to catch 187 tonnes across this whole area. Um, where it comes from, there's no control on. It could all come out of one area, so, so that's another issue we have. And then we have one minimum legal size for the whole of New Zealand. So at the very top of New Zealand, where power go from Cape Reinga down to Stewart Island, the very top of New Zealand, we don't get to catch power, although there's heaps there, because they never ever reach the minimum legal size limit of 125 mils. And down the very bottom of New Zealand, they're faster growing, so they only just reach the size of 125 millimetres. Uh, and we're allowed to catch them, so they have very little contributions of sporting miners. We've fixed all that voluntary as an industry, but um, so that's the root cause of our problem. Oops, is it going to move? Here we go. And here's it just put into a table form, so you can see how we're stretching out across, you know, the very end of the graph here. You know, the, the, the total allowable catches in the QMA type area, and now and now we have a minimum legal size limit that goes across the whole of New Zealand. So the key for us is to getting our scale right back into this area here. We have to, we have to develop systems which allow us to um, man manage power stocks at a reef type system. So to measure, monitor and manage power, we've got to get down to these fine scales and that's what this whole presentation is about. It doesn't like this. This guy, Lord Kelvin, he probably knew nothing about power or nothing about fishing, but he's a clever bloke and he's, what he's saying is exactly true. If, you, if you, you cannot manage it if you can't measure it. And the word he's missed out there for power, uh, fine scale is what we're all about. So to manage at a fine scale, you actually have to measure at a fine scale and that's, that's what this is about. So this is what we've done. We've developed some data loggers and we have this one little data logger that goes in our tender boats uh, and, it's, and that records divers catch. 
and we have another one that goes on the diver that records the diver effort. So this beast here, it can record the lat long time and date uh, at selectable intervals. Each time some, a power diver brings up his catch bag, one of those buttons is pushed and we can also record all of that. And then at the end of the day we record how much they've caught. The specifications of this little beast, what have we got here? Oh, so we can also record other things. The specifications, so we, had, we, we were using off the shelf type products when we started, they weren't working, so we've had these specifically made for us. Uh, the battery lasts heaps of uh, 10 days, we can hold a year's worth of data, and the big thing for us is we can fit a satellite modem into these, and I'm going to show you in the, mid in, in the minute. And we can also use this as the brains of, uh, while we're out there and do other things like have scales, calipers, and shell measuring boards plugged into these. So this is our one. We've got 63 of these out in the industry. They're recording probably 50% of, of the total allowable commercial catch across New Zealand, and that's probably going to increase to 60 or 70% this year. Uh, while I've showed you this slide is the crayfish industry in New Zealand. They're also piggybacking the same technology, and we're developing this very much together. They have their uh, logger called BERT, which I understand is the best electronic recording something too. technology. There you go. Um, so they've got 18 of these out in Cray 5, which is in Kaikoura, and they've got another 20 ordered to spread across their fishery. So it's great when we're sharing technology amongst each other. But you can also go another stage. We could be getting rid of buttons, and we could be having the same as the iPad and smartphones and stuff like that. So these could appeal to some of the smaller fisheries like eels and stuff like that. Same technology, same box, it's just different fronts on them. So here's the one that goes onto the diver. Uh, it's got to be bulletproof for a, diver, for a power diver, so they've got no switches, number one. As soon as they hop in the water, it automatically turns itself on, and it'll record things like why they're swimming on the surface, it's recording the lat long and time and date, and as soon as they dive underwater, the GPS unit switches off and the depth unit switches on, and that records depth and time. We had off-the-shelf type products to do this, but it was a waste of time. As soon as you put a GPS unit under the water, it goes spastic looking for satellites, and it was using a battery up every day. Same sort of thing, plenty of capacity, uh, and they're rated down to 30 and 50 metres, so um, these are bulletproof. And that's what they look like, it's just a little wee pocket on the back of a diver, he doesn't know it's even uh, on him, he's, uh, yeah, everything's automated. So the raw data from these units, we don't actually use the raw data, well scientists might, but this is just showing you what it is. So these little red dots, every, uh, while a diver's on the surface, it's recording whatever the interval is, the GPS and the time and date, and in between each one of those dots, we have all of the underwater profile, how long he's down for, how, long he, how deep he, he was. All of those dots can be joined up to work out how long he swam and, and all that sort of stuff. And then over top of that, so that's the diver unit, over top of that, uh, we've got the boat units which, which is recording his catch. So now you can see where he's landed catch bags and where his effort was taking place. That's great. The best thing about it is it's in a really, really small, confined, fine-scale area. So we're only talking about a 400 to 800 metre area that he was working in in the days. Turning the data into information, that's been a huge, big uh, thing for us. So here's what happens. We have all this information that goes into these two little data loggers. Um, we download those onto a computer, so it's a really goofy-proof system, and we upload those onto the, onto the, into the cloud, if that's what you call it and we can, get, um, we, can, we can interrogate that information and use it on a daily basis. And so here's how we view it. So divers can see their own information, and an ace holder, so an ace holder uh, is the annual catch entitlement, uh, he's normally employing divers. So he can see the information from divers he's employed, and then, this is the tricky one, then we have shared information, and you can imagine trying to get divers to share each other's information, but now they understand what it's all about. I'm gonna show you how it works. And then we give information to scientists. So it's not at this big, big recording area, the statistical area, this is at a square meter area. So here we go, here's, some, here's an ace holder view, and I'm thanking a couple of guys here for letting us use their data. So this is what happens. This has been uploaded live to the web. They can, they can log on to the web, and as you can see, this is Dave Baker's crew, and this year he's caught 28 tons of power, and 96% of it has been logged. He can see the different divers that he's employed to catch that 28 ton and you see the green dot down the left hand side there. Um, so what happens is you have the information coming through from both units and it's automatically sorted out on the internet, we don't have to worry about it, and when you get a green tick it means it's got the catch and the effort, and you'll see some boat ones there which means there was no effort recorded so he didn't have a little data logger on his back. So that's cool, we've got a system that can handle that. Dave can go through and he can search by diver, he can search by years and the quota management areas he's been working in which is great, he can find out what his boys are doing. 
He can also click on one of these entries to find out specifically what that guy did on that day, and this is the sort of information that's automatically uploaded and nobody's entered any of this, it's just an automated system. These hexagonal things, they're a one, he one hectare hexagonal, uh, and they're just created when uh, catch bag has been landed inside that, so we don't have coastline polluted with a whole lot of hectares, this is only operating once a catch bag's been landed. Oh, there, I just said that, right? Oh, so that's what we call our summary. Now we can click on the map view, and here's Dave Baker's information for the top of the South Island. So you can see those, the hexagonals all clinging together there. That's where he spent his last, uh, this last year's fishing. So it's really valuable information for us. I'm going to zoom in now and actually switch to the Chatham Islands because it's just easy to show people. So this is, the sort, this is zooming right in now. So now we're looking at a five hectare patch of the coastline. And you can see the, the graph there, what sort of fish is coming out of there. But what you can also do is click on the hectare and it tells you who's, who's fished it. So we're just looking at one particular ace holder's divers that have worked for him. So that one hectare, six and a half, uh, 615 kilos has come out of it over two days, October the 25th and the 22nd. So this is really, really valuable stuff for us. This is what we call fine scale recording. Or I can, I can use my mouse and I can uh, ring fence this area and I can find out what's happened in the whole area. So 600 odd kilos came out of one hectare, but in fact 1,400 kilos has come out over two days from that area. Really, really valuable information. Then we have what we call CPUE, that's catch per unit effort. So the higher the CPUE, the more he caught per hour. So as you'll notice there, at, on, the, on, the, on the top side, they caught the most weight, but in fact if you click on CPUE, in fact it was the bottom area that he caught the most, the most quickest. So what does that mean? Well, scientists will tell you. So that's, so that's our catch per unit effort. So it's really, really valuable information for, for divers wanting to go out fishing. So there we have, then we have the shared view. So Nick's been out with his crew. He's caught uh, 1,400 kilos over two days at the start of the season. He says, where should I go fishing tomorrow? So he can click on the shared view. And what happens? Everyone else's data comes up. So he now knows where he was fishing in the little... Um, green hoop there, he knows where he shouldn't go fishing because people have already fished there. It's a really sensible fisheries management. He can click on one of those hectares and find out 300 kilos came out of there way back in October, or he can ring fence an area and find out in fact uh, a lot more's come out of there over varying months. So it's a really, really powerful tool to make our guys spread their effort and to reduce the cost of harvesting. Nothing drives us nuts more than divers going back, one crew will go back and hit a reef one week and then the next week, they've got no idea who's already fished there, so another crew will hit it the week after. This will help stop that. Metrics and performance indicators. So this is what we're currently recording, and it's required by the Ministry of Fisheries. We've got catch and effort, and the location is recorded against a very uh, broad scale. But these are all the uh, new things that we've now got. These are all new uh, metrics or new information that we've never had in the past, and we don't actually know what they all mean. So there's a whole heap of stuff in there, and you guys can probably read it quicker than I can. Uh, but really, really important stuff that helps with fisheries management. So these, the learning the relationships of these new metrics uh, in relation to how much fish is there and how much it's been reduced by and what the total stock is. Identify new and useful patterns and trends which weren't previously, uh, previously obvious, I and mean, we've got the systems in place to do that now. This is a big one for us, real-time monitoring of performance indicators, and I'm going to flick on and show you some of those. Relevant management tools, so we're not trying to manage a block on a regional basis now, we're going right back to a paddock scale, which is all good, that's just dairy farming. And real-time harvest strategies. So it's not just about the catch and effort, and I've combined the power and rock lobster because there's benefits for both of us going down this. This is matching market demands with harvesting, so where do you go to catch a particular, particular size fish at a particular month? Forcing the spread of effort across the whole fishery, that's really sensible stuff. Carbon footprints, time at sea versus catch. Traceability of catch, that's the thing that's bubbling to up to the surface. Being able to accurately calculate the loss to fishing, like if you've got a marine protected area or something happening, knowing exactly where the catch is coming from. This is a big one, our guys are out fishing, they've got taking it into a processing firm that night, they've got no idea who's going to be landing catch and employing staff for the next day, so all these sorts of things are, are things that we can start doing. Rock lobster are a little bit different, they want to know some other things like uh, the temperature differential means when crayfish start uh, molting in quantity, quality and the incidence of injury. 
performance of pot type, that's a really big one for them. They've got different pots they can choose from. Now they can work out where they sh those pots are best operated at different locations for different months and the interaction they have with mammals. So this is what we're about. So my biggest, my biggest pain in the neck is getting divers to download their information out of the little units on their back. So they've all just gone back to them and this year we've, we've replaced the downloading, um, the need to download with an automated system. So now we've got a, um, a radio system where the little units on their back automatically talk to the units that are in their tender boats and it's an automated process. The diver doesn't even know anything's happening. That's good. We've also had a satellite modem board uh, made in Nelson for our units, so now we've got satellite capacity, so now we can um, offer the Ministry of Fisheries. It's not, a, it's not a legal requirement for us, for them to know where we are. We like front-footing that whole thing, so now we're saying to the Ministry of Fisheries, we've now got the capacity where you can ping and find out where our boats are. They think it's great, so we get on well with them. And then, so we've also got this capa the capability to work on iPhones and stuff, so a, a person's going out fishing in the morning, he can log on on his, on his smartphone and find out where everyone was fishing the day before and not go there. Good stuff. Next stages, this is where we're heading. Uh, what does this say? So now we've got satellite capacity that we don't have to download our boat units either. That can be a fully automated process. We're about to use a company, um, a third, provi third party provider, Track Plus, who are based in Queenstown but operate in 32 countries of the world. They have all of the stuff we need, the e-commerce system for charging people to go and look. So there's no point in us trying to reinvent it. But this is some of the other benefits. So previously, well, we could offer the Ministry of Fisheries access to our, our units so they can ping it and find out. But there's a whole lot of other data that we're collecting. So to make the Ministry of Fisheries compliance job easier and to reduce the risk on us and hopefully reduce the cost to us, they, they could be using um, this, this satellite system as well and they could be finding out where the unit was, who the divers were, how much they'd caught. They could meet them at the boat ramp and they already know a whole lot of information. So reducing uh, compliance's um, risk is a really big one on our, on our radar. Yep. So now we've got satellite capacity, we've got all this real-time capacity which, uh, which is blowing some of our guys, so we can do things like texting, we can do things like SOS messages, so you've got to imagine our guys working on the Chatham Islands, shark attacks, a big problem over there, you know, what do you do when you're an hour out of port and you're an hour and a half minimum away from, Nelson, from New Zealand, we've got a system now where they can push a button and it sends out a whole lot of texts and emails to all of the relevant people. Um, you know, trip reports and sending messages to the licensed fish receivers and stuff like that. That's real time and then the same day we've got all these new things are about to happen so we can start monitoring fisheries on a same day basis, developing harvest strategies, uh, PCLR returns so our divers have to spend about half an hour after fishing each day when they're tired and wet and they've spent in the water for seven hours. Um, we've been now hopefully we're heading down a track where we could generate electronic forms and they could come from our systems with very little more information required. So the Holy Grail, so where's, this, where's, it, where does, where's it all heading to? So it's an animated load and go of relevant data which updates performance indicators which trigger relevant management at applicable scales. So what does that all sound like easily? Here we go, last slide. So here's a, 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 the Chatham Islands, we've got a 10 kilometre coast, coastline you know the problem we have at the start, which was the start, the scale. Now what we can do is we're heading to this. So I want to be able to mouse over, touch one of those hectares, get a, get a whole lot of key performance indicators that are operating completely independently and automated uh, to find out exactly what's happening in any part of those fisheries and then to do something about it. So we can shut down fisheries, we can stop people growing, going there, we can uh, increase the size limits and all that sort of stuff. So, so basically that's it. Uh, th th these are the companies that have made these tools possible for us. I also should have added on there the Ministry of Primary Industries. They've been a great help through this. And also the Seafood Innovations who have funded it. Thank you.